Good. Okay. Today's speaker is uh, Nolan, Nolan Ash. 99% of you already know Nolan and have heard many of his uh, wonderful talks, The Old Guard. Okay. Nolan graduated Columbia in 1971 with a minor in history. He's a very active member of the New Jersey was Civil War Roundtable. He's also a very accomplished speaker on Ale Alexander Hamilton. Many of you have heard his talks. <clears throat> and uh, from there, why don't you take it over, Nolan? Nolan, speak. Can you see me? Yes. Yeah. Yes, we see you. Okay, that's what counts. You can hear me and you can see me. Okay. Got it. All right. Um, I always, I've always done this in person and I've always answered questions at the end until the last dog died. I was answering questions in the parking lot after they closed down the libraries. Since this is virtual, if you don't get to ask me a question here and now, email me, everybody email me your questions you don't get in and I will answer them. Okay. So now I'll get going on, on Abe, as I like to call him, Abraham Lincoln Abe. Well, historians are, are, are ornery kind of people. Historians don't have unanimous agreement about just about anything. And I get a lot of questions, who is the greatest president of all time, you know, all the time. And all the historians and I give the same answer. The two greatest presidents of all time are George Washington and Abraham Lincoln, hands down because they got us through the two greatest existential crises of this country, the founding and the Civil War. So now I'll launch into a chronological uh, biography of Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln was born February 12, 1809 near Hodgenville, Kentucky. They didn't live in Hodgenville, Kentucky. They were on a poor dirt subsistence farm in the middle of nowhere. And I guess the closest village is Hodgkin, though. His parents were Tom and Nancy. Uh, again, he was born in Kentucky, but they moved to Indiana. Clearly, even his subsistence level farming in Kentucky was not doing well. Very soon there, thereafter, his mother died of something called the milk sickness, which was pretty common in those days. There was no pasteurized milk. There were toxins in the raw milk that people would get, and you'd have epidemics. We got an epidemic now. It was an epidemic of, uh, of milk sickness. He remarried Sarah Saley Johnston. Abe became very close to her and called her mama. Her father, her, his father, excuse me, was a dirt poor farmer who had no use whatsoever for his lazy, shiftless son with his constant daydreaming and loafing and reading books. The only thing, the only thing that mattered to Tom was farming and constant daily hard physical labor. Lincoln was to hate any form of civil, physical labor for, the, labor for the rest of his life. He often <coughs> rented, <coughs> he rented his son to neighbors to do hard physical work for them. They didn't pay Abe, they paid his farmer, his father, excuse me. So Abe was doing the same kind of work that African American slaves were doing in the South, except he wasn't picking cotton, he was splitting logs and doing all kinds of hard physical labor. There is no evidence whatsoever that Abe received any formal education of any kind ever. Uh, a super genius. He got no schooling. Um, one of my other favorites is Ben Franklin, who also was totally self-educated, obviously two geniuses. In 1828, to continue along with his happy childhood, ha ha ha, his sister dies in childhood birth. Uh, two years later, probably out of fear of another milk sickness epidemic, they moved to Illinois. At age 21, Abe struck out on his own to the town of New Salem, Illinois, where he lived from 1830 to 1836. He immediately got into politics. From 1834, he was elected a member of the Illinois House of Representatives for Sagamon County. I don't know if this was a... a, 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 a <clears throat> a, a, a positive slick move by Abe, but uh, in Sagamon County was Springfield, the state capital. By the way, 
So from 1834 to 1842, he was a member of the Illinois House of Representatives. Uh, during this period, he went to New Orleans down the Mississippi on a flatboat. In New Orleans, he saw slavery up close and personal and personally detested it. In 1840, he became engaged to Mary Todd from the rich and powerful and influential Todd family. Their businesses included slave owning and slave trading. The wedding was supposed to be January 1st, 1841. Abe canceled it and called it off. And he would not finally marry Mary Todd until two years later, November 1842. We could spend a half hour just on the relationship between Abe Lincoln and Mary Todd Lincoln, but I won't do that. Uh, <clears throat> the year after he got married, he tried and failed to get elected to the U.S. House of Representatives. In 1984, 1984, 1884, pardon, he bought a home in Springfield, Illinois, the state capital. Let us briefly turn to the very sad story of his four sons. His firstborn, Robert, was born in 1843, he was the only one to outlive both his parents and live to 1926. Second born Eddie was born in 1846, died in 1850. Willie, one of the kids you always saw running around the White House, was born in 1850 and he died in the White House in 1864. His youngest son, Tad, uh, was born in 1853 and died in 1871. So three of his four sons were to die very young. As a lawyer, he quote unquote, rode the circuit for two 10 week periods every year for 16 years, usually with Judge Davis. There were no courthouses in any of these small towns in most of the big towns. So the judge, as you saw in a lot of Westerns, uh, trials were only held when the judge showed up and the judge would go riding around the circuit to all the towns and go to them. This is why the Supreme Court talks about, in San Francisco, the Ninth Circuit, and there's the First Circuit of the Supreme Court. That's how you got the, the, the word circuit for the, for the second name of Supreme Courts. He was a rising talent within the Whig Party. In 1847, he was elected to the U.S. House of Representatives. He, along with his idol, Henry Clay, and you guys heard me once on Henry Clay, a full session, violently opposed the very popular Mexican War. This made Abe a one-term congressman, one and done. The only piece of notable legislation that he ever introduced was to free all the slaves in Washington, D.C. only by buying them. That got nowhere, but he introduced the bill. In 1848, he showed himself to be a pragmatic politician. When it became clear that Zachary Taylor was going to beat out his, old, his, his idol, his absolute god, Henry Clay, for the Whig nomination, he threw his support to Taylor. Clay crafted the Monumental Compromise of 1850, which delayed the war for 10 years, but it was more and more obvious the nation was headed for disunion. In the eulogy for Henry Clay, Lincoln decried fanatics on both sides, he favored Clay's approach of a gradual emancipation through the repurchase of slaves. In 1854, you had the Kansas-Nebraska Act and what was called popular sovereignty. Kansas would vote on whether it would be a free or slave state and Nebraska would vote on whether it would be a free or a slave state. In October 16, 1844, Abe made his first public speech and he declared a strong personal opposition to slavery, but his major theme was preserve the Union at all costs. By 1856, Clay's old Whig party had virtually died. Abe co-founded the Illinois Republican Party, but he hesitated to join it because he did not wish to be associated with abolitionists. Abolitionists were maybe 5% of the people in the North. Most people didn't like them, didn't agree with them, thought they were some kinds of crazies, think John Brown. And uh, as, as Ham, excuse me, as Lincoln said to anybody who would listen, and he said it time and time and time again, quote, I'm just an old Henry Clay Whig. He idolized Henry Clay, the great compromiser. In 1856, the Republicans lose and Buchanan wins. And in 1857, as a result of the Kansas-Nebraska Act, you had the outbreak of the Civil War. 
Most people don't realize it, and only the historians probably know it, but the Civil War started in Kansas in 1857. Tons of violence on both sides. People running in and out of Kansas, pro-union union and anti-union. You had a guy called John Brown that went around killing slave owners. You had the bushwhackers, bloody Bill Anderson, who went around killing union uh, uh, followers. And two of his uh, boys who got their training in violence was a kid called Jesse James and a guy called Cole Younger. They were both with bloody Bill Anderson in 1857 again. Uh, 1858, the first Illinois Republican convention. Lincoln easily won the nomination to fight the re-election of Stephen Douglas to the U.S. Senate. He accepts the nomination and makes one of his many, many brief, brilliant talks. Quote, a house divided against itself cannot stand. I believe we cannot permanently endure half slave and half free. It'll become all one thing or the other. The Lincoln-Douglas debates, there were seven. There were huge crowds. It was famous all over the country and widely rock, or watched. You got to remember in those days, there were almost no forms of public uh, entertainment and political debates were a big public entertainment event. Lincoln argued that all men are created equal. Douglas argued states' rights. Each state should be able to select its own way of life and he constantly accused Lincoln of being an abolitionist. Douglas won, Lincoln lost, but he became a big time national figure in the Republican Party. Now let's go to the 1860 Republican nomination for president. February 27, 1860, the Cooper Union speech. And I know we have at least one alum of Cooper Union in our group, maybe more. He went there to convince the East Coast elites that he was not, not an illiterate country bumpkin from the wilderness. The New York Times reviewed him and said, quote, no other man before had ever made such a great impression on his first appeal to a New York audience. The political genius of Abraham Lincoln will come back again and again and again. An unannounced candidate, Lincoln, appeared in Seward's home state, New York, at an event partially sponsored by Chase. Seward and Chase were the two leading candidates for the Republican nomination by far. They were the favorites. Bates and Cameron were considered the most likely. Lincoln was not even on the screen, fifth choice at best. Now, if the convention were not held in Chicago, it's highly unlikely that Lincoln would ever have gotten the nomination. His mentor, Judge Davis, was his floor manager. He furiously went around and convinced every delegate he could to mentally make Lincoln their second choice. Their second choice. The top two, Seward and Chase, canceled each other out on the first ballot. They hated each other and their followers hated each other. Cameron, pretty much an unknown, a known crook, excuse me, he was a known crook from Pennsylvania, was promised something. He got to be Secretary of War immediately. Now we're in Chicago again, this is important. Suddenly there were quote unquote, massive spontaneous demonstrations on the floor for Lincoln. Think Mayor Daley and the 1968 Democratic Convention in Chicago, where the san sanitation workers roamed the halls, beating up Dan Rather and everybody else and having spontaneous, loud demonstration. Lincoln was nominated on the third ballot as a compromise candidate. Lincoln ran basically on the Henry Clay uh, American Plan platform. I'm gonna go into some detail here because there's a point most people miss, even historians I wanna make. Um, he was in favor of banks, finance, infrastructure, manufacturing, business, global trading, global commerce, all or urbanization, and most importantly, a strong central bank and union. And as a moderate on slavery, not an abolitionist. He's only opposed to the expansion of slavery to the new states and territories. Now, as a Hamiltonian born and bred, this is something I like to make people aware of. Henry Clay idolized Alexander Hamilton. The torch was passed to him in 1804. He carried it all the way into the 1850s. Lincoln was the next generation. He carried the tradition, took the torch from Henry Clay. Abraham Lincoln took the torch 
And Clay was very quiet about how he would idolize Hamilton. But Lincoln was very public of his intense idol idolatry for Henry Clay. And at the conventions, both parties split North versus South. Douglas was the Northern Democrat. Breckinridge was the Southern Dem Democrat. Lincoln was the Northern Republican and Bell was the Southern Republican on the Unionist Party. He wanted to run the Union. Lincoln ran a, a brilliant, brilliant campaign. His image varied by geography. He was the plain talk, common man of the people to some. He was honest Abe, the rail splitter, the country boy. The majority of the population was still rural. He was the articulate, thoughtful, surprisingly sophisticated one to the Northeast and the big cities. Lincoln was not making any public speeches, but he organized a national youth movement called the Wide Awakes, Think Bernie Sanders and the Young Voters. Lincoln pushed him, Lincoln's ads, excuse me, pushed him as the man of the people, the poor boy, Horatio Alger image. The subtext, free labor beats slave labor. November 1860, Lincoln wins. Note that he only won two out of 996 counties, two out of 996 counties south of the Mason-Dixon line. Still, he got 1.86 million votes. He got 40% of the votes in a four-way race. In the Electoral College, it was a landslide. Lincoln got 180 electoral votes in 18 states, and Breckinridge got 72 votes in 11 states. Those were to become the 11 states of the Confederacy. The moderates, the two moderates, Douglas and Bell, got almost nothing. So the Civil War was, was really imminent. It was obvious. Now, in those days, new presidents were not sworn in until March. So December 20th, 1860, six weeks after the election, South Carolina secedes. By February 1st, you add Alabama, Mississippi, Georgia, Florida, Louisiana, and Texas. Now there are seven states. And on February 9, 1861, the Confederate States of America is formed with Jefferson Davis as president and seven states in it. Many were desperate to save the Union. The Crittenden, Crittenden Compromise was the most notable. Not much of a compromise, it seems. Uh, slavery forever. Fugitive slave laws are intact. The interstate slave trade is okay. And slavery in DC is okay. The only thing that was not a slavery plank was no slavery north of the south border of Missouri, the Missouri Compromise Line. Lincoln said, absolutely not, not accepting that. So he's on his way to be inaugurated. And it was a long trip in those days from Springfield, Illinois to DC. Abe made speeches all along the way. To get to DC, you had to change trains in Baltimore. Baltimore was a Confederate stronghold. On his way to be inaugurated, they foiled several assassination plots in Baltimore before he would even get to Washington, DC. Now, Ward Lamon was his friend from Illinois, a huge man. He always carried two pistols and two knives. There's a, a very little known book called Lincoln's Bodyguard about Ward Lamon. He was with him way back in Illinois. For most of the war, Ward Lamon slept at the door to Lincoln's bedroom. There was also a guy called Pinkerton who was trying to keep him alive. There was no secret service. There was no security. Anybody could walk up to the White House anytime. So finally, February 23, 1861, Abraham Lincoln arrives in DC secretly and in disguise. So shortly thereafter, March 4, 1861, he has another immortal speech. I'll read you very briefly from it. In the midst of it, he says, quote, I have no purpose to interfere with the institution of slavery in the states where it exists, only in the new territories. And here's the really famous one, which is the end of this speech. Quote, we are not enemies, but friends. We must not ever be enemies. The mystic chords of memory from every battlefield and patriot grave to every living heart will yet swell the chorus of the Union when they're touched again by the better angels of our nature. I've heard that phrase 
a hundred times recently, the better angels of our nature. Now, let me segue to something else that's really important. I'm going to give you some facts and figures about the U.S. Civil War that was going to start in a couple of weeks. There were 600,000 to 750,000 dead. We have 10 times the population that they had. So it would be as if a war was fought where 6 million to 7.5 million people would be killed and they would all be Americans. The whole war was fought on American soil. The South was virtually put back to the Stone Age. Disastrous. Now another 600,000, call them 6 million, were seriously wounded. People who lost arms and legs, ended up in wheelchairs, had uh, problems with health for the rest of their lives. Now they didn't have the term PTSD in those days, but there were probably another 6 million. Uh, there was, there were, after the war, there were several epidemics. Epidemic of alcoholism, ec epidemic of wife beating, epidemic of insanity, epidemic of people just kind of like zombies who, who were never got back to themselves. And out West, you had some real PTSD cases. Wild Bill Hickok and John Wesley Harden. John Wesley Harden was such a killer that he shot a man dead in his sleep because he thought he was snoring too loudly. That's John Wesley Harden. And there were more and more out West. So let's go to Fort Sumter. Uh, the only, perhaps the only, or one of the very few union installations or union military installations in Charleston Harbor, uh, Union Fort, Major Anderson is, is commanding it. You have cannon all around him, firing and firing and firing. No, I'm sorry, I take that back. I got out of sequence here, excuse me. Uh, both sides desperately wanted to be the first one to fire a shot. And the rebels became the first one to fire a shot because Lincoln was not sending reinforcements to Major Anderson. He was sending suits, uh, supplies. A very civilized start to a very, very bloody war. The fort was reduced to rubble. They surrendered. I wonder if anybody out there knows how many people were killed, what the death penalty was, what the death toll was at Fort Sumter on April 12, 1861. Okay, you've thought about it? Nobody, nobody was killed at Fort Sumter. It was very gentlemanly. No one was killed. They surrendered, they were released, and it was real, real uh, civilized war at first. Three days later, Lincoln calls for 75,000 volunteers. The seven border states now chose up sides. Virginia, North Carolina, Tennessee, and Arkansas go to the south. So with the seven original and four additional, they now go to the seven states of the Confederate Union of America, and they were to stay 11 states through the war. Uh, Missouri, Maryland, and uh, Arkansas, Ten excuse me, M Missouri, Maryland, and Kentucky stayed in the Union, I misspoke. Uh, Virginia, North Carolina, Tennessee, and Arkansas went to the South. Missouri, Maryland, and Kentucky, Kentucky stayed in the North. I'm going to reemphasize this again. April 19, 1861, one week after Fort Sumter, you could not get to Washington, D.C. by railroad without changing trains in Baltimore. Baltimore was a slave Confederate stronghold. On that day, a virtual pitched battle broke out in Baltimore at the train station between Union troops heading for D.C. and the local Confederate sympathizers. More than a few soldiers were killed. Obviously, Washington, D.C. would be totally surrounded by, Maryland, by, by Confederates if Maryland left the Union. It was here that Lincoln did a number of authoritarian things. He suspended habeas corpus, unconstitutional in theory. Uh, he argued, perhaps rightly, that civil, civil liberties could be suspended in times of insurrection. And if this wasn't an insurrection, I don't know what was. So he summarily arrested and imprisoned thousands and thousands of Confederate sympathizers without due process, locked them up. He dispersed large sums of money before they were appropriated by Congress, unconstitutional. On his own authority, he started a full naval blockade of the South. On the other hand, he needed the support of the many factions that made up the North. 
This went all the way from the conservative Blair family of Missouri, who were Union Democrats. They adamantly were for the Union, but had no hatred of slavery. Think Andrew Jackson. All the way from that to the full-throated abolitionists to moderates like himself. There were also more than a few pro-slavery people in the North in places like Maryland and Missouri and Indiana and New York City. A master politician, he managed to pit them all against each other and manipulate them. On August 6th, soon thereafter, he passed the Confiscation Act. It freed slaves who had been forced to aid the rebels and got to the Union lines. So the number of runaway slaves exploded. He got that out of it. Now, in August 1861, General Fremont, a true abolitionist, freed all the slaves under his military authority. Abolition. Lincoln immediately reversed him and returned all the slaves to their masters. To give you an idea of the times, almost immediately, over 40,000 men enlisted from Missouri and Maryland and Kentucky, the slave states that were in the Union. Now, Lincoln was brilliant throughout the war in keeping foreign nations from recognizing or helping the Confederacy. The Trent Affair was the most major, and it was in late 1861. The U.S. Navy seized a British mail ship with two rebel envoys. Lincoln very quickly released them and sent an abject apology to England. England, the South made cotton, England made clothing, the huge trade existed between the South and England, and they were always worried that England was recognized the Confederacy. They didn't, in no smart because of Lincoln's brilliance. Now, in 1862, early on, Simon Car Cameron of Pennsylvania, the known crook who helped him get nominated, was caught, as was expected, stealing money left and right. He was thrown out. Stanton replaces him as Secretary of War. He was brilliant and close to Lincoln for the remainder of his life. <coughs> Lincoln <coughs> practically lived at the telegraph office, office. He had frequent contact daily with all over the war front, everybody all over the war front. He personally ran the war on a very direct basis. You're gonna hear a lot more about that soon. His original basic strategy was protect Washington DC, be aggressive, have a naval blockade and try to take the Mississippi River. He appoints McClellan to be in charge of the army. He was great at logistics and morale and drilling and treatment of his troops, but he was afraid of his own shadow. He spent months preparing an army of well over 100,000 men for what was called the Peninsula Campaign. You guys obviously have heard of Jamestown and Yorktown, obviously. They are two uh, towns or cities just on the Atlantic Ocean. The James River starts at Jamestown or ends at Jamestown and the, uh, I'm blacking out here. Oh, and the York River started at Yorktown. So the James River and the York River were parallel to each other and the, the, uh, the mile or two in between them was the peninsula. So they were ready to go. He kept asking for reinforcements and reinforcements and reinforcements, although he had over 100,000, and it was pretty clear that, that Lee did not have more than 50,000. He got close to Richmond, but was soundly defeated and sent back home by Robert E. Lee in the famous Seven Days. Lincoln fired him in March 1862. He re replaced him with Pope. Pope was an even worse disaster than McClellan. He was awful. At the second battle of Bull Run, when he was in charge, it was a fiasco, a disaster. It was absolutely horrific. And he was replaced immediately. And guess what? Guess who he appointed? He reappointed McClellan two days later. I guess he couldn't think of anybody better at this point. Now, in 1862, in a famous letter to Horace Greeley, Lincoln said, quote, if I could save the Union without freeing any slaves, I would. If I could save the Union by freeing some of the slaves, I would. If I could save the Union by freeing all the slaves, I would. Less than a month later, in Maryland, at the Battle of Antietam, 
the bloodiest single day of the Civil War, 23,000 dead, a bloody draw. Still, enough of a quote-unquote victory for Lincoln to publicly announce the Emancipation Proclamation, which was to be effective in January 1, 1863. Look how cleverly nuanced it is. It freed slaves in the South, where he could not free the slaves and he couldn't enforce it. He did not free the slaves in the North, where he could actually have freed the slaves and enforced it. It was a military decree. It was temporary. It was not even a law. That's the Emancipation Proclamation. November 1862, the midterm elections, a disaster for both Lincoln and the Republicans. He appointed two new CEOs, I call them, uh, Rosencrantz in the West and Burnside in the East. In, 18, in December 1862, against Lincoln's advice, Burnside stormed the heights at Fredericksburg, a total failure and disaster. He too was out. Next was fighting Joe Hooker. Yes, Hooker. Joe Hooker had an entourage that included people that were prostitutes, and hence the term hookers was invented. Against Hooker in May 1863, Lee brilliantly split his army into three parts and badly defeated Hooker at Chancellorsville. He had to go. Nobody wanted to take this job. Nobody wanted to face Robert E. Lee. He finally appointed George Meade. Lincoln also instituted a military draft. The war was not popular in most places here in the North at that time, and you could buy a replacement for $300. So rich people were buying replacements and uh, getting poor people to go to war. And of course, the poor people couldn't avoid being drafted. Many Irish and German immigrants, of course, were drafted, and they were afraid the ones that stayed or left that freed slaves might take their low paying jobs. Civil unrest in many Northern cities was very high. And in the spring of 1863, he began recruiting blacks in large numbers into the Union Army for the first time. In late June, 1863, Lee invaded Pennsylvania. And you all know about the very famous Battle of Gettysburg from July 1 to July 3rd, 1863. About 51,000 people died. I'm not gonna go into any of the details. That would take another 30 minutes. It was a huge Union victory. But Meade did not follow up on it. He might have destroyed Lee's entire army right then and there. Lincoln was furious with him behind the scenes. There was another huge victory at the same day on the Mississippi River at Vicksburg. Now the Union controlled the entire length of the Mississippi River. They had cut the rebels in two. At the very same time, the famous draft riots, the draft riots broke out in New York City. Poor Irish and German immigrants were anti-war and anti-draft. They took over the city, basically. They focused a lot of their violence on African Americans. And in a great historic irony, it was largely Irish troops just rushed back from Gettysburg who killed members of an Irish mob and took the city back from the mobs. Now Lincoln had been defending Grant for years. He had many critics. He was alleged to be an alcoholic and Lincoln famously said, give all my generals the whiskey he drinks. And another famous Lincoln little quote, I like this man, he fights. On November 19, 1863, they dedicated a huge cemetery at Gettysburg. Lincoln was only to make a few brief remarks. Edward Everett orated for two hours. He was the speaker that day. Lincoln was to only make a few brief remarks. Quote, four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. We are now engaged in a great civil war, testing whether this nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. We have come here to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who have given their lives that this nation might live. 
It is altogether fitting and proper that we do this. But, but in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground. The brave men, living and dead, who struggled here have consecrated it far beyond our poor power to add or detract. Now comes the only sentence that did not, was not relevant in the end. The world will little note nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. Rather, it is for us the living to be dedicated to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. It is for us to be dedicated to the great task remaining before us that from these honored dead, we take increased devotion for that cause which they gave the last full measure of devotion. You've heard that often. That we highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain and this government under God shall have a new birth of freedom and that government of the people, by the people and for the people shall not perish from the earth. There were about 10,000 people, they say, and it wasn't sure if everyone heard them, but it was a very tepid response to the speech, not well reviewed in the newspapers, but we know what happened. Uh, wow, wow. Let's bring Ulysses Grant front and center. He'd been largely successful in the West, although under attack for drinking. Lincoln defended him, so he put Grant in charge. We go to the 1864 Overland Campaign. Huge losses on both sides. Lee and Grant smashing into each other day after day after day after day, virtually every day for two months. The carnage, some called him Grant the Butcher. Grant, quote, I intend to fight along this line if it takes all summer. It did. Beginning at the wilderness and ending at Cold Harbor and, and Petersburg, they clashed repeatedly as Lee was forced to defend Rich, Richmond. No more prisoner exchanges. Grant would lose a big battle and immediately go on the attack again. He knew he would ultimately win a war of attrition. Now in the 1864 reelection campaign, Lincoln ran it all himself. He ran against McClellan. For much of, for much of 1864, it looked bad. The consensus was he would lose if Grant did not take Richmond or Sherman did not take Atlanta. Well, Sherman took Atlanta and Farragut took Mobile, Alabama. Ultimately, Lincoln won in a landslide. Most gratifying to him, he got fully 78% of the Union soldiers' votes. After a famous disastrous attempt to get through the impossible rebel lines at Cold Harbor, in the early fall of 1864, both sides settled into a nine month long siege at Petersburg. What was this? This was World War I, 50 years early. Trench warfare, nine months of trench warfare. On and on and on and on and nothing happening. Lincoln met with Grant and Sherman at City Point, right off the Atlantic Ocean. Abe now, decided they needed total war, not just against their army, destroy all their homes, their crops, their railroads, break their spirit. Now this month of January 1865 is chronicled in great detail in the masterful uh, book by Doris Kearns Goodwin, Team of Rivals. And uh, have any of you seen the movie Lincoln? Well, if you haven't, you owe it to yourself to see it. I was saying to people, if Daniel Day-Lewis does not get the Academy Award, I couldn't, would not even believe it, and he did. Um, that was just the month of January 1865 when he managed to sneak in the 13th Amendment to the House of Representatives to abolish slavery. Got it through the House. The Senate had said okay. Uh, also in, in January 1865, he met at City Point with Alexander Stevens and a lot of the senior people of the Confederacy and with Seward for a possible peace. The talks failed. On March 3rd, 1865, Lincoln makes his second inaugural address. And I'll try to say this without getting choked up, but I'm not sure that I'm gonna be able to do it. I'll do my best. This is another uh, incredible speech. Quote, fondly we hope, fervently we pray for this war to pass away. Yet, 
if God wills it to continue until all the blood that was drawn by the lash shall receive death to the north by the sword. And if all the wealth piled up, piled, piled up by the bondsman's 250 years of unrequited toil be sunk, such as was said 3,000 years ago out of the Bible, quote, the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Now we come to some immortal words. With malice toward none, with charity for all, with firmness in the right, as God gives us the right to see it, let us strive to finish the work, to bind up the nation's wounds, to care for him who shall have borne the battle for his widow and his orphans, widows and orphans, he invented it, and to do all which may achieve a just and lasting peace among ourselves and with all na nations. Wow, holy mackerel. <laughs> with malice toward none, with charity for all. Now we move towards Reconstruction. They were thinking about, uh, long before 1865, the North was thinking about what they would do after winning the war. They could see it coming. It's complex and controversial. Of course, the abolitionists wanted to confiscate most or all of the traitors, the rebels' land, and give it to the freed slaves. Drastic punishment, mass executions, mass hangings, to every traitor, including Lee and Jefferson Davis, they could get his hands on. The radical Republicans were virtually identical. They wanted vengeance against the South. Uh, some of them included Sumner, you know about the Sumner Tuttle in Boston, Thaddeus Stevens and Ben Wade. Lincoln and the other mo moderates, Lincoln had a quote, let him up easy. Few punishments if you swore an oath of allegiance. If 10% of the voters agreed to join the union, let them be come back. Tennessee and Arkansas and Louisiana were the first to come back and got the 10% very quickly. Briefly mentioned the Wade Davis Bill of 1864, back to that punitive, to kill the Rebs, Lincoln vetoed it. Lincoln's proposed and signed bill was the Freedmen's Bureau Act, a temporary US agency to meet the urgent needs. The freedmen would get a three year lease on some land and an option to buy after three years in a complex set of circumstances. Only a short-term military control of the South. Now, once again, I'm going to go to the, tr the Holy Trinity, if you will. Hamilton to Clay to Lincoln. During the Civil War, Lincoln passed three of the most incredible Hamiltonian Henry Clay acts of all time. 1862, the Homestead Act. The government would give you land in the West if you will settle on it and improvement, improve it. They needed people to go out West. 1862, the land grant colleges, they set up colleges on government land. You had to have agricultural courses and push a more scientific approach to agriculture. To this very day, we have pretty much to the far East, Penn State, and pretty much to the far West, Arizona State and Michigan State and just about everybody state on Lincoln's land grant policy policy. And third and probably most important of all, 1864, the Transcontinental Railroad. Yes, he passed the law that enabled a right of way on government land to be built, the Transcontinental Railroad to be built. Didn't start until just about the end of the war but obviously they finished it in 1868. <laughs> also, the first federal income tax, they needed money for that war, the first US paper currency. And in 1864, he founded Yosemite Park, the first federally protected park. He also added West Virginia and Nevada to the union. April 9, 1865, Appomattox Courthouse. We're in April, the big stuff happened in April. April 9, 1865, Lee surrenders at Appomattox Courthouse. The war is over. Only five days later, on April 14th, 1865, Lee goes to Ford's Theater. Now let's get into the long backstory of the Lincoln assassination conspiracy. As you know, I believe in virtually no conspiracy theories, but obviously there was a Lincoln murder cons conspiracy. Uh, let's talk about the Dahlgren raid a good friend of Lincoln's, 
1864, he came to me and I said, I'd like to take 500 troops, sneak down into Richmond, free Union prisoners at the Libby prison, and assassinate Jefferson Davis. Yeah. The Dahlgren raid was probably the only military operation where every single one of those 500 people was killed or captured. They found these plans with them, including the killing of Jefferson Davis. Now, up until that point, it was unthinkable to kill somebody like Jefferson Davis or, Lin or Lincoln. Well, once they saw that, the Confederate Secret Service says, well, if they can do that, we can, we can get plots to assassinate Lincoln. And they started a year in advance. First, all the plans were just to capture Lincoln because they needed those prisoners of wars back desperately, desperately. Later on, they added the option of possibly killing Lincoln and the very top of the government. Confederate Secret Service was a very effective and well-funded operation. Now, John Wilkes Booth came from the first acting family of America. His father and his brother were even more famous than he. He got to travel with theaters all over the North and the South, perfect setup for a spy. We don't know for sure if Booth was actually a spy, but he helped the, the Confederate spies. April 14th, 1865. Grant was supposed to go to Ford's Theater with Lincoln. His wife hated Mary Todd Lincoln. Matter of fact, most of the people in Washington hated Mary Todd Lincoln. So Grant bowed out. So if John Wilkes Booth was into the, bo into the theater and was to get the gun right behind Lincoln's head and kill him, if Grant was in that box, he could have killed Grant too, easily. So you would have had Grant dead and Lincoln dead. Next on the hit list was Andrew Johnson, the vice president, next in line. They knew he was in a room in a hotel. A guy called Asarbad went into the hotel. He was either an alcoholic or not, but in any event, he went to the bar, got drunk, lost his nerve, and never made an attempt. Now, Lewis Powell was a top CSS agent, a huge man and powerful. He was to get Seward. He overpowered two strong men and got to Seward lying in his bed. What he didn't know was that Seward had just been in a very bad car accident. There were metal devices all around his neck. It was metal here. He stabbed him in the neck repeatedly. The only reason he survived is because he had this, these metal devices. And the Confederate Secret Service on April 9th contacted Booth and told him to call it off. But he didn't. Okay, I'll end uh, my talk by stealing uh, the end of the, fam the wonderful, famous, and recent Team of Rivals by Doris Kearns Goodwin. Uh, Tolstoy was a massive figure in Russia, a utopian so socialist, a guy with a uh, tremendous following, and he liked to travel all over Russia, which was huge distances. Anyway, on one of his travels, he was actually in Mongolia, and he was captured. And luckily, they didn't want to kill him or he would be dead. He was captured, and they brought him to the, the headquarters, if you will, of this group, and to the chief, to the head man. And he said, sit down. We know you're famous and write a lot of books. Tell us about all the great men of Western civilization. So he talked to them about Julius Caesar. He talked to them about uh, George Washington. He talked to them about Thomas Jefferson. He talked about several, and he stopped. And the chief said, wait. You have not told us about the greatest one of them all, the Lin Kong. So he told them about Abraham Lincoln and his life and his speeches and what he did. And these Mongol savages, if you will, maybe not savages, they took him as a prisoner and went all over Siberia because they wanted to find a large, good portrait of Abraham Lincoln. They finally found it. They brought it back to their headquarters and they worshiped it as a religious shrine. Wow. Anyway, Napoleon Bonaparte was one of the great men he talked about. He was clearly a Frenchman. Um, George Washington, he talked about, who was clearly an American. But Abraham Lincoln spoke universal truths to all mankind with eloquence. Abe Lincoln. Oh, 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 before I go, 
Um, this is about the hundredth talk I've given. The first one where I'm not live. When I'm live, I take all questions until the last dog dies. I'm usually in the parking lot and the library is closed. If I can't get to you here and now, send me your questions as an email and I will answer them. N-O-L-A-N dot A-S-C-H dot com. <laughs> okay, I'm done. Mike? Yeah, th thank you so much. Uh, it's a wonderful talk. Once again, it is on a par with a Ken Burns production. Uh, we'll open up to questions right now. Okay, everybody, we're going to use this protocol. Um, you're all muted, but if you raise your blue hand in the uh, participants panel, we'll take the questioners in order that they've raised their hands. So I think Bill's got his hand raised, but I think he's going to talk at the end, Bill Tittle, unless you have a question right now. I do have a question. Go. Uh, just excellent, Nolan. Um, it appears that the fact Marilyn stayed in the Union was a very important event. Why did they stay? Was the legislature pro-Union pro where the people were against it? Do you know anything about it? Oh, I know quite a bit about it. Yes, they had to keep Maryland in the Union. Actually, when the legislature voted to secede, he surrounded them with federal troops. So very, <laughs> it was a huge majority in, Le in Maryland who wanted to secede and were pro-rebel. They could not allow it. As I said, Lincoln did all kinds of unconstitutional things just to keep Maryland in the Union. John Wilkes Booth was from Maryland, for example. Um, it was really a, a violation uh, a, a, of the Constitution repeatedly. And Lincoln, there is a clause in the Constitution that gives the president extraordinary powers in times of insurrection. A civil war was an insurrection. And, and uh, they were basically put in the Union at gunpoint. Thank right. you. Good, thank mm -hmm. you. Um, and let me remind everybody that uh, really it's, there's only time for questions and not for people to make extended statements. So um, the first hand up is, uh, is Sri, also known as Haas. <laughs> Go ahead, Sa Haas. He's muted. Oh, I thought okay. I muted him. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Alan, thank you very much. And yeah, I learned a couple of new things. For example, the emancipation, I thought it was a blanket uh, emancipation. So you shed some light on that. Nope. The other question I had, suppose if Lincoln was alive today, and if he was the president, how would, how would you think he would handle the contemporary situation? And where would, I, where would we have been? Great question. Uh, all historians hate hypotheticals. So I really have no idea what Lincoln would have done if he was president. Um, that's the short answer since Paul wants me to keep it short and sweet. No, no, you get more time, Nolan. Oh, it's geez. your talk. Oh, okay. I'll try to keep it brief. Um, yes, the Emancipation Proclamation was not all it was cracked out to be when we idolized Lincoln. If he were president today, oh, that brings me to something I wanted to say in the talk. Another question I get is, what is the biggest tragedy in American history? The biggest tragedy in American history, there's a consensus, was the assassination of Abraham Lincoln right after the Civil War began. Of course, we knew with malice toward none, with charity for all, Lincoln would have been able to stand up to the radicals and the abolitionists who force a hugely harsh, massive, brutal, occupation of the South, which they spent 100 years in vengeance. What he would do today, I don't know. It would be brilliant. It would be compromise. That's, a, that's, that's my guess. That's just a guess. Thank you, Nolan. So, Jean, Sean, you're, you're, you're next. Unmute. It's not working. Maybe you have to unmute yourself, Jean. There it goes. Okay. Nolan, I, I wondered, I saw a protege of Doris Kearns Goodwin interview. She had discovered some new notes of a niece of John Wilkes Booth. 
which gave some insights into his behavior. I wonder if in preparing his speech, you found any new documents that, that gave you some new insights. Well, uh, I knew a lot about John Wilkes Booth. There's so many books. I was going to tell you, but it's so intimidating. There are 15,000 to 16,000 books about Lincoln. So they've explored every little thing. Uh, John Wilkes Booth was a Confederate sympathizer long before there was the Civil War. Again, his brother one of the, was considered the greatest actor of his time. He was pro-Union, and you have Booth Bay Harbor in Maine in, in uh, tribute to the Unionist Booth. Um, it was pretty obvious. He probably, the only thing that's not certain, was he a spy for the Confederate Secret Service? Possibly, probably. Was he a big sympathizer who carried letters back and forth during the war between Confederates? Yes. Uh, he, was, he was a clear person. He wasn't one of the people in Baltimore who tried to assassinate him a couple of times. He wasn't them. Uh, but as I said, in, in 1864, the Confederate Secret Service was beginning a massive plot, which they basically carried out. Great. Thank you. John Tomaszewski, you're on. Uh, yeah, hi. Um, I, I, it's funny, I just watched a movie yesterday called The Conspirator. It was about the trial of, uh, of uh, Mary Stewart. Um, it was an excellent movie for those that want to go on. It explained a lot of the things at the end that you explained. But my question is, um, who was Lincoln's uh, uh, speechwriter, or did he have one? Because now everybody has a speechwriter, of course. Every single word was written by Abraham Lincoln that you heard. No, he had no speech writers. He probably wouldn't have allowed any. He was the man behind every single word you heard and thousands and thousands of words. I don't know if I told you or not. Did I skip it? He managed his own reelection campaign personally. And I know I told you he ran the war in micromanagement personal style. So. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Dick Aiken, you're next. Uh, this is uh, for Nolan to comment on. Uh, in yesterday, uh, Sunday's paper, uh, there was a quote. The purpose of the federal government, Lincoln wrote to Congress on July 4, 1861, was, quote, to elevate the condition of men, to lift artificial boundaries burdens from all shoulders, and to give everyone an unfettered start and fair chance in the race of life. This appeared in Sunday's Times in this section, which I uh, mm -hmm. recommend to everyone, and mm -hmm. I like no one's comments. Okay, okay. Obviously, if I was going to quote every major speech Abraham Lincoln made, I, I wouldn't have, I, I'd have to take hours. Uh, that was one, yes, I was aware of, a uh, speech that he made. And again, I think people don't realize that the great emancipator, Abraham Lincoln, he was not an abolitionist. He was not running on a ticket of the abolishment of slavery. As he said in his first amendment, his first inaugural address, I have no wish to stop slavery in the South. You guys can go ahead with your slavery forever. And Abe Lincoln is not going to interfere. Uh, uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, so at this point, just before I call the next speaker, I want to uh, let you know we actually have four distinguished, at least four distinguished visitors on our session today. One is our next speak, next questioner, who is Bob Miller, uh, a, a former uh, director. We also have uh, Art Bauer, a former director. And believe it or not, we actually have Al McRae from Seattle, another former director. And I hope that Al might say a word or two of hi. But Bob is next. Thank you. Oh. Nolan, I love your presentations, your, your talks. I've got a question. Uh, Going to give you a comment before it, though. You know, since we've been in North Carolina, I visited many of the harbor forts. You know, you, and you look at, uh, oh, Fort Jackson in Savannah, uh, Fort Sumter, Charleston, Fort McHenry in Baltimore, Fort mm -hmm. Washington on the Potomac in Maryland. Mm 
Mm -hmm. All of them were designed with their guns facing outward and defensive to protect from a, an invasion from the sea. Therefore, Fort, Fort, uh, Fort Sumter couldn't shoot back at Charleston. You know, and it's the reason they surrendered the next day. But there's been lots of myths and stories about who fired that first cannon. Do you have any idea? Well, as I mentioned in my talk, both sides wanted the other side to shoot first. Anderson wanted reinforcements with troops. Lincoln said, no, that's too provocative. Lincoln did not want to fire first, and, uh, and, and the South did not want to fire first. The general consensus, as you said, Fort Sumter's guns were pointed out to the Atlantic Ocean. They couldn't defend themselves. It was a hopeless situation at Fort Sumter. Um, so yes, it was a very quick surrender. The winners write the history. You know that one if you're a historian. I have always heard that the South fired the first shot. But within six months, when you have tens of thousands, of, the COVID virus has killed, what, 40,000 Americans, I think? At least. The Civil War on this population would have killed six million. Six million. Uh, makes COVID look a little Mickey Mouse compared to the Civil War. So, so people forgot about Fort Sumter until you wrote history 100 years later and people were curious who fired the first shot. But the general opinion at the time was it was the Confederates and the, the I think you now, I haven't heard a historian not say that the South fired the first shot. There's a great story that it's a, a, a student from the Citadel who got anxious and pulled the trigger. Hmm. <laughs> Could be. Could be. I, I, I told you all I know. I, I, I don't care. Frankly, my dear, I, I don't give a damn, really, because whoever fired the first shot, it became academic very quickly thereafter. Everybody seems to believe it was the Confederacy. And given Fort Sumter's impossible position, and who was the first state to secede from the Union? South Carolina. Who were the most rabid slave owners, the most rabid people for the Confederacy? South Carolina. So I got to believe it might have been accidental, but they fired first, I'm almost certain. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Hey, Bob, Al Bob, this is Mitch. It's so good to see you. And I, Paul seems to have wandered off, so I'm going to take over uh, calling on the, uh, the next questioner. But first, we have yet another distinguished visitor. Last week's speaker, Clarence Modest, is on. Hello, Clarence. Welcome back. Glad you think enough to... Uh, Come back and, and listen in from Queens. And with that, uh, Rich Jager, Mitch? you're up. Okay. Can yeah. we ask Al McRae to say a word if he's still on? Sure. You're back in control again. Okay. Take it away. Al, Al McRae, are you still on the call? I think he may have dropped off. Okay. Maybe we'll catch him another day. It's very early in Seattle, so he doesn't like to get up for our 10 o'clock meetings. Okay. So, Rich Jager, you're next. Uh, Nolan, you, you mentioned how early in the war, Lincoln said that um, all he wanted was union and freeing or not freeing the slaves was not an issue. Uh, what finally pushed him to want that 13th Amendment, which did free the slaves? Was it to, to drive another stake into the Confederate rebellion? No. No, not at all. Uh, Lincoln's attitude on slavery evolved. And the man you heard in 1861 was not the same man by 1863. Uh, he had, uh, the bloodshed was beyond human comprehension. Everybody w was, was dying for one cause or the other. Um, he equivocated a lot, but getting back to his childhood where he was a slave, where his father rented him out, and didn't pay him to do field hand work. Uh, Lincoln personally always det detested slavery. But as a politician, as a lot of people say, and some tell the truth, those are my personal feelings. I'm not gonna put them into play as I govern. Lincoln definitely got more and more in favor of freeing the slaves as the war went on. Certainly by um, 1863, uh, he obviously passed the emancipation, which was limited. Uh, but he was president and he couldn't do much more. Uh, he had pretty much, he wasn't freeing the slaves. The 13th Amendment wasn't to punish the Confederacy or drive them down. Uh, it had become an accepted 
part of the Republican, he was in the Republican Party, which included abolitionists and hardcore anti-slavery people. So his party was very solidly anti-slavery. He was moderate, he was very moderate. But over time, he clearly came to believe uh, that they should be emancipated. It was a gradual, slow process. Thank you. So I, we have time for one more question and we have one more questioner, Steve Varley. Go ahead. Th thank you, Nolan, your usual tour de force. Uh, one question for you. You indicated that uh, the two greatest presidents were Washington and Lincoln because of the crises they faced. But curiously, you didn't mention Franklin Roosevelt who faced two crises, the Depression as well as World War II. Well, probably because he is more recent, he is still more controversial. Just like my Winston Churchill, we had people going wild on both sides. Um, he's usually ranked third. So he may, he may bump one of those two guys. He's almost universally, if you want to name three, he would be the third. Fair enough, thank you. Okay, Mike? Yes, uh, thank you so much, Nolan. If anybody would like a continuation of this, when the travel restrictions uh, had, uh, have ceased, I suggest you go to Springfield, Illinois. The museum there is just wonderful, and it is, would be a wonderful continuation of uh, Nolan's talk. Okay. okay.